We are now live on both Facebook and Zoom. Panelists, you can turn your cameras on. All right, so there's just a little bit of feedback, but I think that should be done now. Welcome, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello, Khaled. Hi, Miko. Hi, Yavar. It's so wonderful to see you here. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're having an afternoon event. Usually it's in the evening. Um, oh, I can see lots of people joining us, which is wonderful, um, especially given the extremely sunny weather um, today. Uh, you're tuning into Double Standard, uh, Canada's terrorist list, the IDF, Palestinians, and the case of Khaled Barakat. And we are joined here today by Miko Peled, uh, Yavar Hamid, and Khaled Barakat. So welcome to our guests. Uh, my name is Bianca Jenny, and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, um, which is one of the organizers of today's event, uh, alongside Just Peace Advocates. Um, and you can find out more about our work at foreignpolicy.ca and uh, just, justpeaceadvocates.org. Uh, so the Institute, the Foreign Policy Institute, is, uh, is based in Montreal on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga people and the keepers of the Eastern Door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And um, we also recognize that this land um, has the continued presence of the Métis, Innu, and Inuit people. So again, I want to thank our co-presenting organization, Just Peace Advocates, um, as well as our media sponsor, Canadian Dimension. So please, please do find out more about these excellent organizations uh, and support their work. Karen Rodman uh, from Just Peace Advocates will be posting resources uh, and links to um, organizations and actions for, uh, for further reference to support um, today's event and discussion. Um, and uh, the chat is open, um, as you can see, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So please do keep your comments um, to each other and to our panelists, uh, civil, cordial, and, uh, and free from racist, sexist, or uh, otherwise harmful commentary. Um, all right, we have uh, about 100 people on the call now. That's great. Again, it's fantastic to see um, this engagement and interest um, in these perspectives. Um, so hello, hello to people at home. Hi, Alexandria. Hi, Ali. Hi, Amina, Annie, Audrey. Great to see you. Um, after our speakers give their initial opening remarks, um, we'll be opening it up to questions from the audience. So please do post your questions in the Q&A box, which is just right there. It's easier for us to, to, find, uh, to find those than it is in the chat. So please do post your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can, time permitting. So again, my name is Bianca Mujeni. I'm here representing the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and uh, this is an organization that challenges unjust foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between um, the perception and the reality of Canada's role in the world. So our organization is reliant on contributions from our community to keep doing this work. So please do consider donating or becoming a sustainer at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. So for today's event, um, as the killing uh, of Al Jazeera reporter um, Shireen Abu Akleh and the attacks at her funeral uh, today demonstrate, the violence of the Israeli military continues unabated, um, as does Israeli expansion of settlements and the suffocation of, of Gaza. And so this event is about double standards. Um, we know that uh, Canada is complicit in violence and in colonialism. The Canadian military has many joint initiatives with the IDF. Uh, Canada sold the IDF $20 million in weapons in 2020. Canadian officials continue to turn a blind eye to illegal recruitment uh, for the Israeli military in Canada. The Canada Revenue Agency takes a hands-off approach uh, to registered charities that violate um, its rules by supporting the IDF. And Ottawa has shown themselves to be largely indifferent to the violence of the Israeli military. On the other hand, Canada takes a very different approach to Palestinians. Um, Ottawa has placed more than half a dozen Palestinian groups, including the government uh, in Gaza, on its terrorist list, um, which makes it illegal to, to work with them. And as Yavar will discuss, um, the first ever Canadian-based group added to the terrorist list was the International Relief Fund for the Afflicted and Needy, or ERFAN, um, which was designated uh, a terrorist organization for supporting orphans and a hospital in Gaza through official Hamas-controlled channels. So in short, um, 
Canada's terrorist list criminalizes uh, the colonized. Um, over 10% of this list is from Palestine, uh, long occupied land that makes up barely a tenth of a percent of the world's population. Um, so this afternoon's event is going to explore the remarkable double standard um, that we're seeing and how attacks from anti-Palestinian organizations um, and groups against uh, Khaled Barakat, who is on this call today, play a part in this. Um, and so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker uh, of the afternoon, Yavar Hamid. Um, Yavar practices as a lawyer in Ontario with a focus on racial profiling, uh, uh, lawful expression, equality rights, prisoner rights, and migrant protection. He routinely represents individuals in respect of harassment complaints involving CSIS, as well as state surveillance within Canada's Muslim and Arab communities. He's acted as counsel in several national security cases in the federal courts, including as a lawyer for Irfan Canada with respect to revocation of its charitable status. Yavar also teaches a course at Carleton University. Welcome, Yavar. Thank you so much, uh, Bianca, and thank you everyone for, for attending today. Uh, in, in my comments this afternoon, I wanted to uh, deal with, with three things to give you some of the context that will be really a lead up to uh, uh, what's, what's happening to um, Palestinians um, uh, outside of Canada, but um, the, the effect in terms of solidarity activism, in terms of charities work, in terms of the, the good political uh, advocacy and just humanitarian work that uh, Canadian organizations can do uh, has been stifled in the Canadian context. And I want to give you uh, one case study, which is a former client of mine, uh, Irfan Canada, uh, which was affected uh, both uh, politically and legally uh, in terms of um, uh, its uh, revocation of charitable status. And so I want to deal with my comments in three parts. I want to talk a little bit about the background of Irfan Canada's case. Then I want to specifically focus on the um, this this listing of uh, of terrorist entities uh, regime under the Criminal Code of Canada that's uh, Section eighty three of the Criminal Code why that's so dangerous and why in my view although this has not been um, definitively uh, tested in the courts that uh, that regime is uh, is contrary to um, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and therefore, uh, in, in, in my submission, unlawful. That's something we attempted to do, but we didn't actually get to argue that in court. And I'll tell you why. But finally, I'm going to end up in my third part with some sort of brief recommendations in terms of um, the implications of what I would suggest is um, uh, criminalization with respect to uh, expressions of support and solidarity uh, for uh, Palestine humanitarian effort and how that's manifest in Canada. So uh, Irfan Canada uh, is uh, an, a not-for-profit organization. Uh, at one point in time, it was uh, a registered uh, charity uh, in Canada. In uh, 1997, uh, it was so registered uh, uh, federally under uh, Canada's laws. Uh, under the uh, Income Tax Act, uh, uh, charities uh, in Canada uh, have um, uh, provisions in order to fundraise and to uh, uh, be able to, to receive charitable contributions, which allows uh, those entities to actually um, function. That's the lifeblood of the organizations. And uh, as you'll see from, from what happened uh, to your fan Canada, uh, it was uh, attacked uh, because of its uh, advocacy and, um, and, and human humanitarian work uh, in, uh, in Gaza and in, in Palestine. Um, Irfan Canada, as um, many charities in, in, on the Canadian spectrum, uh, was subject to an audit by um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the charities uh, directorate. Uh, it's part of the Canada Revenue Agency. And this is something that's not uncommon administratively or organizations, charitable organizations are subject to uh, these peri periodic reviews. But what's significant about uh, Irfan Canada's case is that um, I, I mentioned to you a moment ago, it's, it's registered in, in 97 um, for work, which is predominantly uh, about humanitarian and um, 
uh, uh, disaster relief work, including the, the supplies of um, um, uh, medical relief and support to disaster stricken areas. And so one of those areas, not the, the sole area, but at the time, uh, there was uh, an assessment made that support needed to be given uh, to Gaza. And uh, the, uh, some of its, its operations were set up uh, with partners to uh, deliver humanitarian uh, assistance. Now, uh, in 2003 and 2004, uh, the first of uh, two audits was done uh, of um, IRFAN Canada. And on the basis of that audit, and, and, and this looks at, you know, does the organization uh, keep uh, its books uh, appropriately? Does it comply with regulatory records, things like that? Uh, it, it, uh, it complied uh, with the, uh, the, the, the necessary requirements under the income tax, and it got a green light uh, to move forward. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the context, however, within which that, um, that audit in, in 2003 and 2004 occurred was, um, was on the heels of political statements. And those political statements were being made uh, in parliament at the time uh, by the uh, uh, conservative uh, party, which was then in opposition. And one member in particular, Stockwell Day, who uh, pointedly said that Irfan Canada was a front group for Hamas. Now that, that comment, that, that political comment that was made in the House of Comment, Commons was, um, uh, was, was false because that, that was not the case. It wasn't factually uh, the case. It wasn't uh, uh, ever substantiated in, in any audit, but it raises the specter of suspicion. It raises the specter that the, the, the purpose of this um, you know, group that's involved in humanitarian work is really uh, to, to support and uh, advance the, the interests of another organization. It's a front group. Uh, that, that's the word uh, that, uh, that Stockwell Day uh, used. And what I would uh, draw your attention to, and afterwards, I'll perhaps um, provide you with the link to this report, but it's an excellent report uh, that um, was uh, uh, completed by uh, Nadia Hassan and, and Anwar Ayman uh, in uh, um, March of last year. And uh, this is called um, Under Layered Suspicion. And in that, um, uh, in that report, there's a very detailed analysis of the Irfan Canada case. And it, it gets into some of these parliamentary discussions where uh, Stockwell, they very pointedly talks about um, uh, certain organizations playing quote unquote footsie with Hamas and goes on to say explicitly, and this is uh, quoted in the report that uh, Irfan Canada is a front group for Hamas. Now with that political statement, with that uh, statement, which was designed to be incendiary, was designed uh, to uh, um, uh, sort of portray uh, Irfan Canada's hum humanitarian organization as a purveyor of, uh, of war, of, uh, of terrorism, of the celebration uh, of, um, you know, a killing of civilians, the exact antithesis of, of what this organization was about um, was uh, sort of a, a, a segue or, 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 or a contextual um, uh, consideration when this, um, you know, independent, I, I say the, the, the charities directorate is an arm of the government, but it doesn't take, um, you know, necessarily its cue from a political statement that's made in the House of Commons or otherwise. But what it does, and I think this is really important about the, the you know, the, the um, Khaled's case that we're talking about today, is when um, baseless uh, 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 accusations, allegations are made in the public sphere, when they're circulated in parliament, and then become the fuel for, uh, for, for media stories, these stories gain their own legs. And because of that, administrative and bureaucratic processes uh, can be triggered, uh, which would have devastating effects for organizations. Now, Irfan Canada, as I mentioned before, was as a, charity, uh, a charitable organization when it was in operation. And I must add that it's not in operation. And by, by virtue of what I'm going to tell you today, it's impossible that Irfan Canada uh, can function or can ever function. So Irfan Canada has never supported uh, terrorism or any terrorist cause or or entity. Uh, it has worked uh, with organizations and has supported uh, the destitute. Uh, it has uh, supported uh, orphans. Uh, it has supported their, their, their health care. And in large part, um, the, uh, uh, what, what became the subject of a new audit 
of, uh, of, of Airfound Canada after the first 2003-2004 uh, audit, there was an audit between 2008 and 2010. And what's significant about that is that despite the fact that already they had the green light after the Stockwell Day comment, the resurgence of this political story of how um, an organization, a humanitarian organization could possibly do humanitarian work in Gaza, uh, deliver uh, you know, humanitarian services and not be involved uh, in, in terrorism or terrorist activity, that's something uh, that um, the Canada Revenue Agency sort of took heart, took to heart. And so a new audit was triggered uh, within essentially uh, uh, about five years of the first audit. So it gets the green light, um, Airfan Canada, and then it's plunged into a new audit. And in the context of this new audit, there are uh, pointed allegations, more pointed allegations that suggest that the level of supervision and control that Airfan Canada uh, should have been, um, uh, you know, uh, should have been demonstrating uh, was not uh, manifest and, and that it was basically allowing its resources to be co-opted for terrorist purposes. Um, that in uh, 2008, 2000, uh, between 2008, 2010, uh, became the subject of a notice of revocation. In 2011, uh, there was a revocation of the charitable status of your fan Canada, all built upon the, the initial sort of um, political statements that were translated into um, um, media statements, and then that gained legs in a second administrative investigation. Um, the events sort of uh, uh, come to a head, they coalesce uh, in um, uh, uh, 2011, uh, a, uh, an appeal is done to the Federal Court of Appeal of um, the, uh, the, the revocation of charitable status of, of your friend Canada. And in, in uh, that appeal is uh, initially on at an, an internal level, it's, it's rejected. It, it gets before the courts by 2014. It's quite a, a, a lengthy process. But um, on the day we attempted, uh, we started uh, to argue our, our appeal saying that essentially this is politicized. This is um, uh, uh, political uh, uh, propaganda. It's not, uh, um, you know, um, evidence-based uh, contentions. Um, the, the, in that context, only days before we went to the federal court, uh, Irfan Canada was listed as a terrorist entity. And the devastating thing about being listed as a terrorist entity is immediately your assets are frozen. Uh, it becomes a criminal offense to donate to that organization. Um, anyone who donates to a, a listed uh, uh, terrorist entity can also be uh, imprisoned, can be, can, be can be charged criminally rather. So it becomes a criminal offense just to be associated with uh, a listed entity. Now the listed entity process is um, it's, it's what they call ex parte. It isn't part of an adversarial process. There's no, uh, there's no procedural fairness in it. You don't get to know the allegations against you. We just learned about it days before we were going to court to defend this organization for what we were considering to be the improper removal of its charitable status. And so now we were faced with two problems. Uh, one, our, our, our uh, client was uh, a listed entity. And um, secondly, we were trying to get its charitable status back. Now, in the context of that Federal Court of Appeal hearing, the government uh, uh, said that, um, you know, we're, we're ready to argue our case and we want to, uh, you know, uphold the position to, uh, uh, to have this charitable status revoked. Uh, we argued, uh, well, how can we possibly do that? Because we have to first fight the listing uh, of, uh, of the organization as a terrorist entity. Now, um, something that's, that's quite significant here is under uh, section 83, we'll give you a subsection here, but if people are interested, we can, we can talk about it more. 83.08 of the criminal code, you, you list the entity, but then any financial contribution to that organization, including um, uh, financial transactions for the purposes of retaining a lawyer, those transactions are criminalized. So as of the moment that we were standing, you know, days before we were standing in court and at the time we were standing in court, it now became uh, a, a, a criminal offense to, uh, to, for that organization to retain a lawyer uh, with, uh, with, for monetary services. So what had to happen from that point onwards of, uh, of May 2014, uh, Airfan Canada had to defend itself for free. And so 
what we, and I say we, I was part of a legal team and I had uh, uh, experienced and excellent lawyers with me, uh, Faisal Mirza, uh, as well as uh, Irfan Sayed were, were part of the, the legal team. And for years, we tried to um, uh, uh, fight on behalf of the organization. We went to federal, we first asked the government, can you allow special dispensation to pay a lawyer? Uh, it was indicated um, by the attorney general, no. Uh, you are not allowed uh, to, to get that special dispensation. So you have to do it for free. We went to the federal court to ask the federal court uh, for its disposition. The federal court uh, said, no, we will not allow you on an advanced cost basis. And so finally, we sought actually uh, special funding under the uh, um, court challenges program, a special uh, uh, program to challenge the constitutionality of unconstitutional laws. Um, that application was, was also rejected. So for all of those reasons, by virtue of the very listing, by virtue of this continuum of events, the organization uh, becomes criminalized and the very process of trying to become delisted, uh, you, you are not permitted to financially fund that. So the upshot of all of that is that the, the double standard at play here uh, is that the, this criminalization uh, that um, uh, is manifest in terms of this listing process, it is an unfair process, it is arguably an unconstitutional process, and part of the unconstitutionality in that process is that one cannot even properly retain uh, a lawyer for the pro a purpose of delisting. So those things are, in, in my experience and my submissions, fundamental, uh, the, the legal community was, was in outrage about it. And uh, certainly in the context, we'll hear from the other speakers, that is a danger of criminalization of the Palestinian cause. And it has clear ramifications uh, for funding to uh, solidarity and humanitarian organizations and the individuals that work with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yavar, for that really clear uh, presentation and for giving us the incredible, really outrageous details of the Irfan case, its criminalization, and also greater clarity into the political dynamics um, playing out. So thank you so much and thank you for your advocacy in the Palestinian struggle and beyond. Um, I want to remind people that there are um, Nakba Day actions across the country this weekend, uh, marking 74 years since the ethnic cleansing and forcible displacement of Palestinians. And uh, you can find a link to this in our chat. Um, Karen Rodman from Just Peace Advocates will be posting uh, a link there. Um, so please do uh, turn out. There's going to be uh, events happening in numerous uh, cities across Canada. And uh, we encourage you to raise your voice uh, in solidarity with Palestine. Our next uh, panelist of the evening is Miko Peled. Miko is an Israeli American activist, author, and international speaker. He's the author of the books, The General Son, The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, and Injustice, The Story of the Holy Land, Holy Land Foundation Five. Welcome, Miko. Thank you. It's uh, good to be with you. Good to be with this panel. <clears throat> And nice to see so many participants uh, coming to, to listen and, and engage in this important conversation. Um, I have to say that listening to Yavar, you know, it's almost like, um, well, not almost, there is a playbook that was written by, by Israel and, it's, and, and, and the, various, um, the various Zionist organizations around the world that are, um, that are, you know, a playbook by which the, 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 this is taking place. I mean, the book I wrote um, a few years ago, the story of the Holy Land Foundation, the uh, injustice, uh, is precisely describing uh, what Yavar pretty much described: how uh, an organization that was doing nothing but good, individuals um, who happened to be Palestinian and Muslim, but uh, living in America, who did nothing but good their entire lives, were accused, were targeted, uh, articles were written about them. Uh, papers were written about them, describing them as terrorists. And at the end of a rather long process, but a process that succeeded nonetheless, five excellent um, Palestinian Americans ended up in federal prison with very, very long sentences. Two of them received 65 years in federal prison, Shukri Abu Bakr and Ghassan Ilashi. Uh, Mufid Abdul Qadir received 20 years and Abdurrahman Ode and uh, Muhammad al Mizan received 15 years. Uh, thankfully, Abdurrahman Ode is now out of prison. 
but uh, Muhammad al Nizain, because he had, there was some uh, lack of clarity, his, his naturalization process wasn't complete. He is now um, in the custody of ICE and looking at a, at a very possible, um, um, you know, being, being deported. But these men did nothing wrong. The Ahodan Foundation did nothing wrong. And what we're talking about really, as we think about this, um, we're talking about an entity, which is the state of Israel. We're talking about um, the entire Zionist movement, which is, is made up of many, many different entities, many different organizations, which have been engaged in theft, in murder, in ethnic cleansing, in displacement, and as we know, officially from the amnesty report that came out just a few months ago in the in in the crime of apartheid and we're talking about the end this entity that has been engaged in these horrific crimes for almost 75 years accusing those who would defend themselves from it um, of terrorism when we stop to think of it this way, I, I, you know, it, it just, it just, it's just, you don't, you don't even know what to say. It is such a strange um, uh, reality. But this is what, what we're really talking about. We're talking about the state of Israel, which is, which is a criminal entity, the face of which we just saw in the, in the, in the, um, the killing, and then the funeral of of Shireen Abu Akleh. But really, we've been seeing for years and years and years, murder, theft, abuse, abuse of rights, uh, and ethnic cleansing. And of course, like I said, the, the, the crime of apartheid as it is, as it is defined um, in international law, a crime against humanity. Um, and getting away with it, completely getting away with it. And anyone who, sta who tries to stand up against it, which are primarily the people of Palestine and Palestinian victims of these crimes and those of us around that, that are trying to, to support them and, and, and uh, be part of their struggle, being accused of terrorism. And as a strategy, I have to say, you have to, you have to applaud the Zionists because it's a strategy that's working. It's working here in the United States. Uh, it's working in Canada. It's working in, in, in Europe. Uh, people who stand up for Palestine are immediately labeled either terrorist or anti-Semitic, but right away they have to be, they're on the defensive, right away they have to defend and prove that they're not what is being said about them, while the actual criminals, while those who are engaging in this horrific, horrific acts of, of, of brutality and violence in Palestine are literally, literally getting away with murder. Uh, they don't need to spend any time defending themselves because they spend all of their time planning how to attack Palestinians, how to attack Palestinians uh, who stand up, how to attack organizations that seek to support Palestinians, whether through solidarity, through pol political action, or through relief. And um, these countries like Canada, like the United States, like the Europeans, are you know somewhere between accomplices with these into to the crimes and and enablers of these crimes. Not only do they not just stand by, but they are actively selling weapons. They are actively making it possible through the shipment of um, shipment of weapons, but also transfer of 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 endless funds. You know, I always say Israeli soldiers can swim in hundred dollar bills. They can fill bathtubs and, and and light cigars with hundred dollar bills. There's so much money going there. Um, and um, and the other side, those of the you know those of us who want to support Palestinians, want to send money to Gaza. God forbid. Or of course, it's not only Gaza that needs money. Uh, immediately has to go through all the scrutiny, and uh, and then make sure that we are squeaky clean somehow, so that we don't end up um, dealing with terrorism charges. And um, again, it's all about these laws that are similar to the Patriot Act in the United States, the material support laws and so forth, that incriminate the victims, incriminate those who want to stand up for the victims, incriminate those among the victims who stand up and fight. And actually, I think we have, with the, with the uh, amnesty report that came out in February this year, 
it very clearly states how the state of Israel has been engaged in the crime of genocide since its very establishment, uh, which of course is very important. They talk about the Naqab, they talk about Jerusalem, they talk about Lid, they talk about every part of Palestine, not only the customary West Bank and Gaza, which are actually a very small part of Palestine. Um, and it's very, very clear that anybody who stands up against Israel, anybody who resists in any way, shape, or form, anybody who supports the Palestinians, is actually engaged in combating apartheid, is actually engaged in defending the victims of apartheid from this horrific crime, which is known to be a crime against humanity. Now, I and many others, you know, uh, claim that it's not only the crime of apartheid that Israel is engaged in, it's also the crime of genocide and, of course, ethnic cleansing. But the amnesty report is, is, is very precise and very clear, and it gives us, in a way, not that, not that the authorities and the establishment is listening, but it does give us a, um, a foundation from which to say all of this all of these accusations of terrorism, all of those who accuse Palestinians and those who support the Palestinian cause or the cause for justice in Palestine, uh, terrorists are out of their minds because the state of Israel is in fact an apartheid regime and any and all resistance to it is not only legitimate, it should be applauded. It should be supported. The supports of the countries around the world should be given to those who oppose Israel, to those who oppose Zionism, to those who reject Zionism, to those who expose the crimes of Zionism, not only since the state of Israel was established, but even before that. Um, and the Zionists know this. The state of Israel knows this. That's why they invest so much in attacking uh, in every which way they can and making sure that they build this uh, wall around them so that anybody who tries to attack them is immediately uh, accused of terrorism, of supporting terrorism, uh, and has to go through all these processes of, of legal, legal, uh, legal processes and, and, and sometimes immigration processes, sometimes just accusations and so on. Um, it's also why you know, they spend so much money on uh, education, on making sure that the education, the textbooks here, for example, in the United States, go through a Zionist scrutiny before they are published. And the Zionists have their own organizations here, which make sure that social studies in America and public schools have the right words and the right terminology, the terminology that uh, the Zionists um, uh, uh, prescribe. Um, so they, they know that they are actually um, in a very precarious position because they are committing these horrific crimes because the, no, the world knows. I don't think anybody who is, uh, who is accusing Khaled Barakat um, of, of, of terrorism knows that it's nonsense. I mean, it's obvious that it's nonsense. It's, nobody really thinks that any of the organizations support Palestine and support Palestinians are terrorist organization. Nobody has any doubt, I believe, that what the state of Israel is doing is an actual state-funded mega uh, terrorism. That the Israeli army is, is a glorified terrorist organization. Um, but some people think it's okay. And some people uh, choose not to get engaged in this because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to get involved in this in this web of accusations and this web of of, of, of being called anti-Semitic and so forth. And so, um, in, in a way, we we're in this. We may be in a, in in a, in a place right now where there is an opportunity to push back and just say, well, look, Amnesty International just told us. And it's not the first human rights and uh, uh, civil rights human rights organization that's telling us this, but has just told us after a very long, lengthy process of research with very clear data that the state of Israel is engaged in the crime of genocide. How could you possibly accuse Palestinians, Palestinian organizations, civil rights and humanitarian organizations around the world for rejecting this and for supporting Palestinians? How could you possibly stand up and not participate in the struggle against the apartheid, in the struggle to end the apartheid regime and to free Palestinians and free Palestine. So this report, I think, in many ways, gives us, gives us uh, that opportunity 
but still the 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 wall of defense that the Zionists have built around the state of Israel is uh, is a very very uh, sturdy wall, and it has so many different parts to it that um, it's it's very difficult to battle because it's got you know because uh, you know it's it, and also they've been doing it for a very very long time, they've been at this for a hundred years. Um, and that's why we stand here uh, talking about this um, and, you know, in many other conferences, I was just at another conference in New York, the other conference also talking about the material support and talking about all these things that are coming at us and how we defend ourselves, where in fact, re really, we should be talking about how we defend Palestinians from the state of Israel, how we defend Palestinians and how we push the apartheid regime out and and work together towards a free, liberated, democratic uh, Palestine. Um, so I think this is you know this this leaves us uh, this leaves us um, uh, in a position where in a way we need to think more. We need to act smarter. We need to organize better. We need to collaborate more with each other. Um, and again, just just just. Uh, a, a quick observation: This this um, conference that I was in New York just last weekend, the Lauda New York conference, it was held at a space called um, the People's Forum, which some of you may be familiar with, which is a wonderful space for um, and has a great vibe to it. And in this space, where you had pictures of Che Guevara and and, and Lenin and all these, you know, very you know, very dedicated socialist, you know, people who who, who fought for the people. You had ultra orthodox Jews. You had Muslims, observant Muslims. You had the Jew, you know, all all different types. You had communists, you had artists, you had speakers, and so on. And everybody was there, united for a single cause, and that cause was, was rejecting Zionism, rejecting the apartheid regime, and standing up for a free and democratic Palestine. So I would think I would just to say that in this, in that spirit, I hope more of us can get together, and quite a few people are listening and network more so that we can stop defending ourselves from these ridiculous accusations like the ones Khaled is dealing with right now and support Palestinians and support a free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miko. Thank you for that call to organize uh, as well and for, for giving us context about the crimes of uh, the Israeli state, IDF violence, violence that Canada has supported uh, materially, diplomatically and otherwise and for clearly underlining the double standards and the plight of those who stand up for Palestine and, uh, and against the crime of apartheid um, and the ways that they're kept on the defensive. So again, thank you for that call, that call to organize. Um, I uh, want to take a moment to let people know that we do have a letter writing action uh, telling jo uh, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, to end support for the IDF, for the Israeli military, uh, in the aftermath of the killing of Palestinian journalist uh, Shireen Abu Akhlad. So Karen Rodman from Just Peace Advocates um, will be putting that link in the chat. Um, it really, it is so great to see so many of you here at the event. There's 173 people on the call right now. I want to also encourage people on the call to share this event um, on their social media. Um, we have a link uh, that uh, you can post to Facebook um, with your friends at home so that they can also uh, watch and follow along. So our final panelist of the evening is Khaled Barakat. Um, Khaled is a Palestinian Canadian writer and activist his writing has been widely published in Arabic and in English in venues such as Al Daab, uh, Al Akbar, and the Electronic Intifada. He's the co-founder of Mazar Badil, the Palestinian Alternative Revolutionary Path Movement. Welcome, Khaled. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca, and thanks to uh, all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be with you today. Uh, thank you for the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And let me begin by expressing our full support and solidarity with the struggle of uh, the indigenous and native people on this land uh, for self-determination and for their struggle to decolonize this land. Uh, I am speaking to you from Vancouver unceded territory of the Musqueam and Squamish and Salil uh, White Tooth Nations. And I want to also salute all of those who are struggling here uh, on this continent against racism and oppression. Uh, 
and for those who express their solidarity with us and support the campaign led by the Canada-Palestine Association. I found myself uh, obliged to introduce myself uh, even in a couple of minutes, uh, something I'm not used to, uh, but uh, uh, I feel that I, I must because, as you all know, the infamous right-wing uh, newspaper, National Post, have decided to introduce me to their readers uh, the way they uh, wanted. And uh, I feel like it's important that uh, I do that myself. Um, well, because everything they have written pretty much is wrong. Uh, the only thing probably they got right is my name, uh, and even that they, they massacre a few times. Uh, so my name is Khalid Barakat. Uh, I am a Jerusalemite, born in Jerusalem, Palestine. Uh, I was born in 1972. I studied uh, my elementary school in Palestine, and for reasons that uh, you don't want me to get into, I left school at a very early age. I was 10 to join the Palestinian working class uh, before uh, I left to New York. So for the past 40 years of my life, I have been a, a worker uh, and uh, now I am a writer. Uh, you know, workers could also be writers. Uh, and currently I publish in Al-Adab uh, and in the daily newspaper of Al-Akhbar, a Lebanese uh, newspaper. Um, as you know, uh, for the past few weeks, uh, we have been subjected to a uh, racist and smear campaigns led by pro-Israel uh, lobby and Zionist organizations in Canada with coordination, full coordination of the Israeli embassy and the right-wing fascist uh, trends in, in this country. And it's a campaign full of lies deception uh, and ideologically charged. I mean, uh, most of you uh, probably know that, but it's important to, to highlight uh, some of the um, things we notice about this campaign and not just this one, but uh, the systematic political campaigns that designers uh, are engaged in. One of their objectives is to spread fears uh, manufacturing of fear is, you know, a dictator craft. Uh, and the Zionist movement uh, are uh, very uh, good at that. Manufacturing fear, they know that fear is a very powerful tool. Fear um, creates mistrust between people. Fear pushes people to disengage themselves from participating uh, fear blocks dialogue between people, and at the same time, uh, it uh, separates people. It creates, uh, you know, um, uh, worlds of uh, us and them, and uh, uh, usually it is uh, marginalized and oppressed uh, communities that is subject to, uh, to this. Uh, and so they wanted basically to say to the Canadians that you know, there is a, this dangerous uh, terrorist man who's been living in Canada for the past 20 years, and you should be careful. Um, and, you know, they decided to publish uh, uh, my pictures. And, you know, you can tell they, they used, uh, you know, this picture, you know, uh, with the uh, full um, first page and, and then uh, uh, create uh, this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, a story that will uh, do nothing uh, but uh, mislead uh, and deception to the uh, readers and to the people. Uh, they reminded me, you know, of um, these Hollywood movies, uh, you know, like uh, Air Force One, where Harrison Ford plays a heroic American president, you know, who, who beat the hell out of the Russian terrorists. Uh, these, these images that they try to portray about uh, people. Uh, and so what is the solution that they presented? 
uh, uh, you know, deportation. Uh, they say, you know, the best thing to do is to deport this guy. Isn't he a Palestinian? Well, then we can deport him. You know, Zionist campaigns against Palestinians, uh, whether in Palestine or outside Palestine, they always feel that they can bully us and that they can actually do whatever they want to. I mean, if you're an Israeli soldier and you kill a Palestinian in Palestine, you won't even spend one day in jail, whether this Palestinian is a child or an old man or a student or a man or a woman. You can do that. Crime and crimes against Palestinians is, uh, happens with full impunity. Uh, and so they wanted to create fear in order to actually justify oppression against Palestinians here and elsewhere. And we have seen how imperialist powers who are backing Israel are doing exactly that. I mean, in England, in Germany, in France, in the United States and Canada, these campaigns of oppression against Palestinians and their supporters is uh, very visible for those who uh, wants to see. And, you know, the deportation um, is also part of that manufacturing of fear, is that if you get engaged in politics and if you criticize Israel, and if you support Palestinian resistance, be careful because we can deport you. And I know a little, you know, one thing or two about deportation and displacement as a Palestinian. We know that this is always used in order to oppress refugees and immigrants. And I have seen the fear in the eyes of refugees and immigrants in this country uh, when it comes to deportation. That's why um, I have participated in co-founding organizations and collectives that defend immigrants' rights and refugees in Canada, like No One is Illegal Collective and other campaigns. But the Zionist organizations here want to implement the Israeli style in Canada. You know, they look at Canada as if it's a greater Israel, and so they can do that. It's a settler colonialist state, after all. And if my name was like Arnold and I'm white with blue eyes, would the Zionist lobby here say deport him? I don't think so. The reason they say that is because, you know, I am a brown uh, person and uh, they immediately uh, were very much hasty of assuming that he probably lives here on a visa or temporary residency, you know. They did not uh, know or uh, assume that I am a Canadian citizen since 2003. And of course, you know, deception uh, is the tool. And that is to tell you uh, half of the story or mix lies and facts in order to create this deception. So they'll tell you, for example, that this man was deported from Germany and he's barred from entering Germany and the German government did this and that to him, but they won't tell you that there is a court ruling in Germany in March 11th just uh, happened. It says that banning me and putting a political ban on my events in Germany was illegal. And that's a German court rule. They will not tell you that. They will not tell you, for example, that you know the reason I was barred from entering the United States, even though I lived 14 years of my life in the US, is because we were organizing the first tour of a South African comrade who was invited. We invited him to do a political tour to speak about the similarities between South Africa and, uh, and Israel. And, uh, you know, the United States confiscated my residency in the US. And they said to me that because you're a Canadian citizen now, they did not even give me a reason. And they said that after September 11, we don't give reasons why we are, you're not welcome in the US. And when I asked about this here, they told me that, but this happens to thousands of Canadians, you know, uh, uh, not being able to enter the US and the vast majority of them are actually white Canadians. So you're not the only one. This is a policy that the US is carrying, uh, you know, against people uh, and uh, you're just gonna have to live with it. So, 
They don't tell you the whole story. They don't tell you the whole thing. But it shows also that there is a high level of coordination between the so-called, you know, um, benign breath, uh, like they uh, present themselves as a human rights organization. And they say that they were engaged in collecting intelligence information for the past two years, and that they've been working hand in hand with Israeli security agencies. I don't know what kind of human rights organization is this, or Sija, for example, or other organizations who are very much connected, deeply connected into the Mossad and the Israeli you know, military and, and intelligence. And they say that publicly. And so they are working on behalf of Israel. They don't care about the security of people in Canada and the well-being of people in Canada. They actually, it's the opposite. They want to create, as I said, fear and mistrust and we know their games and their schemes i mean we've been fighting them for a very long time and we know all of their games they want to tell you that you should be uh, afraid of palestinian and lebanese resistance they don't say for example you should be aware or scared from hezbollah why should we be scared from hezbollah why should we be scared from hamas why should we be scared from the pflp did Hezbollah, for example, carry any uh, acts against Canadians here or against Canadians outside of Canada? Zero. Did Hamas attack any Canadians or any Canadians outside of Canada? Zero. And the same goes on the PFLP. They did not attack Canadians. I tell you who killed Canadians. Israel did. Israel killed Canadian citizens in Gaza. And Israel wiped out a Lebanese Canadian family. In Lebanon, it wasn't Hamas or Hezbollah, it was Israel. But because they're Lebanese and Palestinians, they didn't care about them. And that includes the Canadian government, who did not give a damn about these Canadians. Israel forged Canadian passports repeatedly and carry espionage operations and assassinate Palestinians and others. It wasn't Hezbollah who forged Canadians you know, uh, citizen and um, passports uh, or Hamas. It was the Israeli Mossad and the Israeli government. They, were they accountable? What did the Canadian government do? Nothing. And so Israel is the one who is carrying these crimes and implementing these crimes. And it is known and documented crimes. And yet Canada still express its support to Israel, material support to Israel, with arms, deals, with economic support, with political support, uh, covering all Israeli crimes. And you cannot distinguish today between the Israeli official position and the Canadian government position, let alone you know, these stooges in the uh, conservative party and the fascists. So why should we be scared from Palestinians and Lebanese resistance? In fact, we should normalize the relationship between people in Canada and the Palestinian and Lebanese resistance. You know, in 2006, the Lebanese community in Windsor wanted to put a billboard for uh, Hassan Nasrallah. And the Zionist movement went crazy for because of this. And they said, you cannot do that. This guy is uh, uh, leading a terrorist organization. Well, we know that Israel and what Israel thinks of Hassan Nasrallah. But why should we think of Hassan Nasrallah and adopt the Israeli narrative on someone who have the utmost respect of hundreds of millions of people in the Arab world and the Muslim world? And how can Canada actually engage in a real dialogue with the Arab world and with the uh, uh, Muslim world and with the you know, uh, camp of resistance in the globe if they are going to criminalize Palestinians and Lebanese resistance? So why are they doing this now? I mean, wh why Israel is looking to its allies, their European, imperialist back backers for help. The reason they're doing this is because Israel is in crisis, real 
crisis. And I'm not talking about the crisis that Yehud, Barak, and Netanyahu speak of their gibberish about Israel is not going to make it to its 80th birthday because of biblical, you know, uh, stories and, and issues. I'm talking about a real crisis in a uh, scientific materialist analysis. If we look at the situation today of the internal situation of, the, uh, of Israel, we can see that this is a entity that has reached the peak of its uh, power. Israel today is the only nuclear power in the area. So they have 350, maybe 400 nuclear warheads. So if they add another 101, what does that do? It do nothing. They're already saturated with power. They get support, full support, from a country like Germany, the worst uh, you know, um, uh, government in Europe that is uh, backing Israel, supporting them with nuclear submarines for free. That's what they give Israel. Israel today roam uh, freely in the Red Sea uh, and in the Mediterranean with their nuclear submarines. They're establishing military bases across, uh, uh, you know, uh, Yemen. Uh, looking into creating wars and aggression against their neighbors, mainly Lebanon and Syria, even Iran, and possess a real threat to the peace and to the stability of the region and the world. People and the young generation of Canada is realizing this more than their government, and that's why we see a real movement happening in the universities and in labor union and including high schools. I mean, high schools in Ottawa uh, in an initiative by uh, students in, the, in, the, in high schools are taking initiative to walk out in the anniversary of a Nakba to express their support for Palestinian rights and for the uh, colonizing of Palestine. Israel sees that and they know that when the, these popular movements are growing, particularly on the calling of the boycott of uh, Israel, that uh, it deepening the crisis of Israel. Now, they also attacking us because they don't want you to think of the 60% of the Palestinian people who lives in the diaspora. Palestinians are not just in the West Bank. Palestinians are also in the diaspora and in exile. And the vast majority of them are actually refugees who are today mobilizing and rising and trying to regain back their voice and liberate their voice once again. But when they try to do that, and Israel cannot do to them what it do to our people in the West Bank, placing them in administrative detention and, you know, uh, massacres. They cry for Germany to do that. Germany just banned the um, rallies of commemorating in Nakba in Berlin. And they say, the, the, the police said to Palestinian community and their supporters, you cannot organize a rally commemorating in Nakba because when you do that, that's an anti-Semitic thing to do. And so we see that Palestinians are actually fighting this camp of imperialist colonizers, Arab reactionary regimes, and Israel. And that in order for us to carry on the tasks of struggle, it is important that we realize that our camp has to be also an international camp of progressive national liberation movements uh, and also uh, a camp that provide an alternative uh, um, solutions and alternative uh, paths. Uh, and so it is important to realize uh, just one uh, minute on the, um, the attacks on Sami Dun, uh, the Palestinian 
prisoner solidarity network because really that's the target. Uh, and that's because Israel doesn't want people to know what is happening inside its prison. Currently, there is 4,500 Palestinian political prisoners. Israel and its backers in Canada wants people to think that these prisoners are just a bunch of terrorists being locked in jails, and that's it. Sami Doun exposes this lie by saying that these 4,500 Palestinian political prisoners are actually the Palestinian uh, leaders of the movement. These are the leaders of the student movement. These are our teachers, our union uh, activists and workers and uh, uh, you know, uh, Palestinians who are mobilizing in their refugee camps and villages and cities uh, to carry on the struggle. They don't want you to know what the Palestinian prisoners had to, had to go on a daily basis confronting Israeli jailers. They don't want you to see what Palestinian prisoners are writing, you know, in literature and in other uh, forms of art. Anyway, I will stop here, but uh, looking forward for uh, the discussion and for any uh, questions we can answer. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Khaled. Thank you for sharing your story um, and your own, you know, what you have personally faced and for outlining this, you know, this tremendous media spin uh, Canada's complicity as well um, in the crimes uh, of Israel, including against uh, Canadian families, um, as, as you stated, and for the messaging that uh, fear mongering does separate us um, and it does marginalize us. So thank you for making those connections um, also to the Indigenous people uh, of Canada. Um, it's, time for, uh, it's time for Canada to end their disproportionate uh, treatment of colonized and colonizer. So I'd like to uh, invite all of our panelists uh, to come back um, for the Q&A session. Um, that's going to be starting now. Um, I also want uh, just to give you a note uh, to all of you at home that we will be rebroadcasting this discussion, uh, both to YouTube uh, and on Facebook. Um, so please do subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel because um, you'll get immediate notifications there. Um, also, if you haven't already done so, please place your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, so that concludes our presentations for today. Um, Khaled, I'd, I'd like to invite you also to come back um, and join us. Thank you. Um, and so we're now going to move on to the Q&A portion of the, the evening. Um, we do have a few people that uh, sent us questions in advance, as well as um, a few that have been posted here. Um, the first question that we have is from Alexandria. Um, who asks, if Israel is declaring the five Palestinian orgs as terrorists, um, uh, does this allow them to deem those employed um, supporting the orgs as terrorists? What is the implication on those abilities, individual, the individual's ability to move freely? Is the U.S. likely to apply that same terrorist label on them and prevent them from participating in social uh, and political life as well? So... I'm, I'm going to put that question maybe first to um, Yevar as the as the lawyer, but please feel free uh, others to jump in if you have uh, if you'd like to respond to that. So uh, th thanks, Bianca. So so I um, I think I might have responded something in the chat as well, but um, I would restrict my comments to the Canadian context. Uh, it's it's a it's a bizarre process when an entity is listed. Like the entity can be listed today and you don't know that the entity is listed and for example if you're an employee of that organization you're going to report to work so the, the mere listing in and of itself doesn't necessarily make you as the person affiliated with that organization at least under Canadian law engage in a criminal process unless you do something more and the something more in the Canadian context, which is so debilitating, primarily for the life of that organization, but mainly from a donor perspective, uh, what some of the other speakers have talked about from instilling fear in um, individuals who support that organization and for the organization itself to financially transact. So if, for example, you could have like a volunteer association that had no sort of material or financial contribution to the organization, you would be running a perilously, um, you know, close line in the Canadian context of just 
keeping that entity alive. But primarily, I think the thing that's most objectionable in a Canadian context is that uh, by listing the entity, you cripple it financially, and anyone who donates to that entity can potentially also be criminalized. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. That was that was pretty clear. Is, would anyone else like to uh, jump in on that question? I'll, I'll jump in if I may real quick. In the U.S., in the case of the Hurland Foundation, there are thousands of people who are listed on what they call an unindicted co-conspirator list. And so, and we're talking about thousands of people who worked, who participated, who donated money. Um, and so you may know that you're on, may not know that you're on the list and you may decide you want to apply for a job as a teacher or a job, any, any kind of job that requires a, uh, a background check by the FBI. And suddenly you're a co-conspirator in a terrorism case. So that is very, very serious. Apologies, I'm on mute. Uh, Tina in, in uh, the Q&A box has a follow-up question, which is what happens if we make a donation to one of these organizations that's now deemed terrorist? That's material support, I think, isn't it? That, that, that would be material support to a terrorist organization in the US. In, in, in Canada as well, under 83.08, uh, I think uh, sub C of the criminal code. It is a violation of the criminal code of Canada and you could be charged with an offense. When, when we were representing uh, Irfan Canada in the Federal Court of Appeal, if they paid us as of the listing, which was in late April of 2014, um, the organization or us, uh, the, the lawyers, we could have been criminalized as well for, uh, for uh, accepting those funds uh, um, uh, and being part of that material support. I may say, uh, Bianca, just a, a word on that, and that I think it's important to differentiate between organizations and institutions who are being listed on the Israeli terrorist designated list and the Canadian and the US uh, uh, ones. Uh, and it's important because, you know, if we look at the origins of these lists, it actually started in 1997 during the Clinton uh, era. And that is because they wanted to what they call defund, uh, you know, terrorist organizations. The target is the popular classes that benefit from the support of institutions like Irfan, and they that's the target. And also, yes, you can donate to organizations who are being uh, placed on the so-called Israeli terrorist list. I mean, according to Canadian and U.S. laws, that that is okay. But if they are in the U.S. and Canada, that's the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. The next question that we have is from Felix, um, who'd like to know what is the, it's a very broad question, what is the US, Canada, EU's end goal for the state uh, of Israel? Um, uh, do any of you have uh, thoughts on this? What, just what's quickly, their end goal? Quickly, I mean, <clears throat> if we look at Israel as a settler colonialist project, Israel, it's serving these imperialist powers. Israel is a project for these imperialist power. Once it becomes a burden on them and not beneficiary, they will close it down. They will shut it down. The only reason that there is this state called Israel is, is, is well funded and, and powerful is because the United States, Germany, Canada, Australia, UK, and others wants, wants it to be that way. So, it's really important that Israel becomes a burden on these imperialist power and that we look at them as a, not just complicit in Israeli policy, but they, they are also uh, part of the crimes. And that's why it's our responsibility, especially for those of us who lives in these countries to, uh, to pressure uh, you know, the ruling classes and the governments to change their uh, course because Israel has no future in Palestine, Israel will end and Israel will not sustain itself whether they keep pumping oxygen and military and uh, money to them or not. They are doomed to fail. And the only way that we can, uh, we, we need to speed that, uh, you know, as much as we can because the alternative to Israel is a future Palestine where people live equally under one law where everyone in Palestine enjoy freedom, equality, justice, 
and not just uh, a group of people uh, uh, as it is happening now in a settler colonialist apartheid system. Thank you, Khaled. Does anyone else want to jump in on this question of the uh, US, Canada and EU's end goal? I'll just add, well, just a word. As Khaled was describing this, you know, on the one hand, you see these endless, endless amounts of money, not just foreign aid, but, you know, money coming from all kinds of not for profits, um, both in the US and in the West in general, billions, untold billions of dollars that are tax free going to the most violent parts of Israeli society, to the most violent settlements, to the most rabidly racist, you know, gun toting settlers. And that's fine. But God forbid that you should support Samidun. God forbid that you should support any of the any of the prisoners that are held. And as Khaled was describing, these, these are all these are all freedom fighters, political prisoners. It's a it's an absurd reality. And I agree with Khaled as well. I, I will we it is up to us to make sure that that becomes a burden on these countries, that Israel becomes a burden, and we're gonna to have to do that. Thank you. We have a question from Donna Ashimok, who wants to know how indigenous peoples that stand in solidarity um, with Palestinians can better support uh, on this issue. I think that uh, support uh, is, has to be mutual um, uh, and um, colonized people uh, absolutely need to have their, their front, their united front, because every victory for indigenous and native population anywhere uh, in uh, Canada or elsewhere is a victory for Palestine and, and vice versa. And so that's really important. But also it is important to see that Zionist uh, organization try to portray themselves as the indigenous, you know, people of Palestine. And so they try to have that bridge with some of the uh, indigenous group and to, to, to sell that, you know, fabricated story. But I think that it's, it's a lot of work and responsibility of us. Uh, this is a, an internal task that we need to deal with. Thank you, Khaled. Um, so we have a question that was submitted uh, in advance, um, which is, should the terrorist list exist at all? Should it be abolished? What are, what are, what are folks' thoughts on that? It should be, of course it should be abolished. I mean, I would replace the terrorists that are on the list with the state of Israel and all the NGOs and not-for-profits that support Zionism. If, if I can add to that for, from a legal perspective, and I think uh, Khaled uh, touched on this as well, the, the process of listing, and we have like a no-fly list, we have the, the a whole sort of menu of these different listing processes, a lot of these which came into currency uh, in the last two decades, but they, the, these are odious processes from a legal perspective because they're what they call ex parte, which mean that um, the, the the person is not involved. It's a confidential process based on confidential information. We talk about separate lists, such as lists in Israel, secret information may be the basis of it, as well as um, political propaganda. We don't know what the basis of it is, and it becomes a reverse onus uh, for people to get off the list, for organizations to get off the list with the added advent, as I described in my earlier comments, that you don't even have the ability to fund yourself uh, to, to get off of it. So it's, it's extremely problematic. Whereas from a legal perspective, if you are to actually have an, an, an adversarial process where you challenge someone, where they have the right to actually see that evidence, what is the basis? Are, are you actually saying that this organization supports uh, terror? Then show us the evidence. Uh, in the Air Canada case, if I can just add this last comment, what had happened is that the evidence or information gleaned from a charity's audit was basically shared with Public Safety Canada and it became the basis for a listing when we had already debunked that information, an allegation of $14.6 million of aid to Hamas, where um, almost the, the majority of it, I would say about 80%, over 11 million of that 14.6 was literally in kind uh, medical equipment. The, the rest was actually very uh, pretty closely uh, monitored uh, support for, for orphans and uh, you know uh, support for, for individuals. It was not any of it going to violent or, or terrorist uh, interests. Now, I'll just add, if I may, also a word to that. 
in the case, in the trial of the Holy Land Foundation, a representative of OFAC, which is the Office of um, Foreign Af uh, the, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, uh, which is part of the Treasury Department, was asked about the process by which an organization or an individual gets designated, and uh, and it was very clear that the burden, the standard, is far lower than the standard that you'd expect in a court of law. So it's actually very easy to designate someone. If I may, Bianca, just add a quick note. Yeah. That is, these lists sometimes, because of the, the it, it is orchestrated to deceive people. So what happened is that they list organizations. Some of these organizations uh, that they list is actually uh, like fascist and, and Nazi organizations, but they mix it with revolutionary movement. So you'll see the Communist Party of the Philippines and right next to it, the KKK, and after that, Hezbollah, and after that, some, you know, uh, uh, white supremacist, uh, you know, small group. And that is to deceive people and say, this list, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's important to see that, yes, there are some criminal groups uh, mm -hmm. uh, there, and they should be tried as criminals. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the reason they're there is to deceive people and to say they're all one, they're all the same. Hezbollah is just like ISIS and ISIS is just like Hamas and, and all this rubbish. If I can add just one, one further comment, because I wanted to comment on something that Miko mentioned. There is an intersection between the Fans Can uh, Canada case and the Holy Land Foundation case because um, the naming of the unindicted co-conspirators uh, had carryover to including Irfan Canada within that ambit uh, of these unindicted co-conspirators, which Miko mentioned, uh, is not really, in, in, a, in a Canadian context, it's not really juridically cognizable. We don't know like what that standard is, and it's a very low standard, but it's not certainly one that we apply here. But through this amorphous process of the listing and prior to that, the audits process, this innuendo in the American context was imported into the Canadian context and became a veil of suspicion around the organization. So the permeability between borders of using some of this information, which is not really criminal charges, it's not evidence-based, it just becomes absorbed and it gets used to the, to the detriment of these organizations. Thank you. So the next question I have um, is for um, Miko. Um, we have a question about, uh, well, I'll, I'll put two together. We got one in, in, in advance, which um, is about um, Israeli violence. And uh, someone wants to know uh, about pre-state Zionist groups leading up to the, the IDF. And I thought I would pair this with Nadim's question for you um, about playbooks. Um, Nadim asks, uh, uh, about Israel having done an excellent job of coming across as victims. Has anybody done a playbook of how they've done this throughout history? Um, would it make sense to try and do what they had done as Palestinians and use their strategies against them? So those are the, the two questions. Well, the, the Israeli army and the state of Israel was established, were established um, while these you know, these paramilitary groups, uh, Zionist uh, terrorist groups, essentially, were in the process of the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Palestine and terrorism, terror which is basically an, 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 an enormous act, you know, a campaign of terrorism that is, the, you know, that is hard to even imagine. Um, and then they, once the state was established, was in, in May of 1948, and of course, all of these, all of these groups basically came together and formed the Israeli army. Mm -hmm. And then they continued the same, on, you know, on the same vein of, of, of really attacking and terrorizing civilian populations, which is what they do to this day, except that today they've got much more weapons and the weapons they use can kill a lot more people. Mm -hmm. um, although now they do it with, you know, nice uniforms and fancy jets and, and you know, all this, all this modern uh, uh, weaponry. Uh, so that's kind of the history of that. I don't know if that's what they meant by that. Um, and I think there is actually a lot to learn from the strategy and from the PR and the, you know, that the, that the Zionists are, are engaged in, have been engaged in for going back at least 100 years. In other words, when people talk about the Zionist lobby, 
they think of you know a bunch of people in suits in in, in the capitals of different cities and in, in the capitals of this capital cities of different countries in the world. That's part of it. The bigger part of that is done in local politics. It's done in small communities. It's done in uh, in public school textbooks. It's done here in the United States in the, you know, the level of, of school board, the level of city council, the level of mayor. That's where these lobbies work the most. That's where I think the most valuable work that they do is. And that's why today, for example, and, and we, this was touched upon, um, there is no history of Palestine. The only history of Palestine is what the Zionists have been telling people, which is um, either the history of Israel or the Bible. And the fact that Palestine as an immensely important strategic space, you know, has a rich and an impressive history, uh, politically, culturally, religiously, in every sense of, of that you could possibly imagine. And none of this is being taught. None of this is being discussed. And most people, if you ask them, they know nothing about, they don't even know that the name Palestine has a history going back, you know, thousands of years. People always refer to that. So they've done a great job pushing that. And that's really, in many ways, why they're winning this war, why they're succeeding. And I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from that um, for us as we campaign to re, you know, reclaim Palestine and present it back to the world as Palestine as opposed to being Israel. Thank you, Miko. So we have um, a lot of questions about the, uh, the, the terrorist list itself. Um, we have um, concerns people have about um, uh, whether or not they can donate to, hold on, let me just, just one second, let me find the question. Um, yeah, someone asked, uh, can I make a donation to groups like Al Haq or Bissan or Adamir? Um, will I be targeted if I do so? Um, there's a lot of folks asking questions like that. Um, and so I, I'm wondering about that. And then also whether any of the political parties um, are talking about the terrorist list. So um, perhaps Yavar, if you could let us know, you know about some of these concerns that people have around um, donating to groups like Sami Dun um, and so on and so forth. And then, um, and then maybe we can follow up with a question about um, you know, what are the political parties saying uh, about this terrorist list? Certainly. So I think uh, Khaled raised the, the important distinction between uh, Israeli listings, other foreign government listings versus Canada's listings. So under um, 80, Section 83 of the Criminal Code, a listed entity is a defined entity. So there is a finite list. We can put, I can put the, the link in to all of the organizations that are listed. Um, to the extent that those organizations are sort of being talked about now, there's aspersion, uh, aspersions against them. I think now is really the moment to, to lobby and you know um, push this into the light, to have a, really a public discussion about it, as opposed to um, you know, allowing this stuff to fester, allowing innuendo to go around because that's what happened with their fan Canada. There was, there was lead up to it uh, and there was innuendo from, for example, the Holy Land Foundation. A lot of factors uh, uh, coalesced, but ultimately it was an organization doing solid work. It was working uh, in Gaza, working in sort of the, the, uh, an area where like factually, well, talking about organizations uh, in Palestine, because they have that factual nexus, there's always that possibility that Canadian officials and politicians can try to draw a link between just the material good work they're doing and what, what I would submit, and we did in the Airfan Canada case, is to say that this, this is just specious. If you're doing humanitarian work, if you're doing solidarity work, uh, which is not, uh, you know, violent in, uh, you know, in its uh, in its expression, in terms of anything in 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 the nature of its activity, then it, it can't be, um, you know, the, the the subject of a listing. So, uh, for many reasons, as I've indicated, the listing process itself can be constitutionally challenged, but. The really important part is to uh, advocate and bring into the light uh, the fact that these are legitimate human rights organizations that should not be listed. And um, you know, donating now and donating when these uh, entities are not listed is completely permissible. But what I think, as, as Miko and Echada both indicated, the idea is 
cut off these organizations and cut off support by listing them. So I think that popular support and public support and public debate will potentially uh, quell the, the political impetus for, for listing. Thank you. So we are coming close to the end of our time. I think I'm just going to take uh, two more of these questions. Um, the next one is from Yuri, who wants to know what hope there is to get a democratic one state solution, as those in the uh, BDS slash Palestine solidarity movement advocate, because even when Jewish voices or Israeli voices speak out um, against what Israel is doing, the same routine of smears, campaigns and whatnot still wins over the, the, the cause of justice. So maybe I'll start with, uh, maybe I'll start with Miko. Well, um, um, you know, I, this comes back to us. I mean, people always say, how long will it take before Palestine is free? Is there a chance for Palestine to be free? Of course, there's a chance for Palestine to be free. I think it is inevitable that, that a free democratic Palestine uh, will emerge, that the apartheid regime will collapse. I think, uh, and I think Khaled alluded to that as well, I think it's almost inevitable because it's not sustainable. Uh, at the same time, the question is, well, is it going to happen today, tomorrow, in 100 years? And that is where we come in. In other words, that is where our organizing, our, um, our advocacy, our support for the Palestine, this cause of, of a just and free and democratic Palestine comes in. There's a tendency to wait for others to do it. There's a tendency to wait for something to do it, for Bernie Sanders to come, for this guy to come, for this person, for Salah Hadin to come, you know, for somebody to come and save us. That's not how it works. You know, we are the ones that are either going to make it happen sooner or later. And the more we organize, the better we are at explaining because the truth and the justice are on our side and the facts are on our side. The other side has the big, big microphones and a lot of money. Um, so it's it's upon us to 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 um, to do this, I think. But again, I'll say I think that I think that if we understand the issue of Palestine well, and if we know Palest those of us, you know, if you know Palestine and you know Palestinians, there is no doubt that a free, democratic, uh, well-functioning, productive um, Palestine is is absolutely upon us. And I think that. I'll say one more thing. If you we were sitting here in 1988 or even 1989, and somebody would have suggested that within five years, Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa, people would have thought we were nuts. So I think it can happen very quickly, but we really, really have to mobilize. We have to organize. We have to broaden our network uh, and broaden the message. Thank you, Miko. And uh, the final question we have um, is for Khaled, which is, you know, what has the what has the personal impact been on you through all of this? Um, uh, before I answer this question, I think uh, I agree with what Miko said, and I also would like to add that it is important to present an example uh, before the liberation of Palestine, because this is important the people see an example of mutual struggle and uh, and people are struggling together, especially the uh, participation of various different uh, backgrounds in the movement. Uh, I am a firm believer that, you know, Palestine, as Ghassan Kanafani said, is not the cause of only the Palestinians, but it's the cause of every revolutionary uh, of our uh, era. And so, um, it is important to to join, you know, uh, the the role that the Jewish comrades play in our movement for the liberation of Palestine is vital, is important, and it can be because liberation of Palestine has to people has to see it before it happens, and they see it in the movement itself, uh, and how we organize and how we uh, uh, you know mobilize our forces. At the same time, um, you know, for the personal impact. Uh, on me, I mean, of course, there is uh, there is a personal uh, uh, impact, but uh, this is something that uh, I don't want to say it's the daily lives of uh, Palestinians. This is how Palestinians kind of live their daily lives, and uh, you know, uh, especially for someone. Uh, that has nothing to do in, in his life, but, you know, to struggle for Palestine. This is part of our life. 
So the way to deal with this is just to fight back and to uh, realize that it's part of, of the struggle. Um, that's it. I mean, I don't have really any uh, else to add anything else. All right. Um, do, uh, do any of our panelists have any uh, last words that they'd like to share with our audience before, um, before we end our event this evening? All right, so um, I just wanna thank you so much uh, for being a part of this discussion. Um, to all of our panelists, thank you for your incredible analysis, for your advocacy, for your journalism and for your activism. Um, it's, really, it's really been a great event and um, I know that our audience has learned a lot. Um, so thank you, Yavar, thank you, Miko, thank you, Haled. Please do find out more about the work and writing of all of our panelists. Um, we put lots of links to their work in the chat. Let's take their words very seriously and continue to organize despite uh, an atmosphere of fear um, and you know, media spin. There's lots of actions that you can take. Um, you can take action and tell uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to end support for the IDF um, in the wake of the killing um, of, this, of the journalist. Uh, and uh, uh, Shireen, um, with this letter writing campaign, you can join a Nakba Day action this weekend. Um, please, uh, please do consider uh, supporting um, the organizations that have, uh, that have been mentioned today, Just Peace Advocates. Um, also consider making a, a donation to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute at foreignpolicy.ca uh, slash donate if you like events like these. And once again, I'd like to thank our brilliant panelists, uh, Miko Yavar, um, and Haled, as well as Karen from Just Peace Advocates, who co-organized this discussion. And thank you to the audience for your participation, for joining us, and for your excellent questions. Um, that's it for our event. Uh, and good evening, everybody. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.